morning, Dave Smallshire. It's my pleasure to introduce you to the wonderful world of dragonflies and damselflies. Why are people interested in dragonflies? Well, here's just a few things. They are indeed, um, in many cases, really, really photogenic, beautiful creatures, very exciting to watch whizzing around as adults, and they do provide a certain um, challenge to identify, the sort of thing that attracts many bird watchers to bird watching. As insects, um, which are generally quite difficult to study, dragonflies, of course, are quite big, and that makes them much easier to see, find, and look at closely. They have unique mating behavior, which we'll deal with later. They're top predators uh, in the aquatic world, uh, both as larvae and then later on as these wonderful adults zipping around during the summer months. Most dragonfly species um, are said to indicate good water quality, and uh, there are a few that can breed in rather poor quality water. Um, but generally speaking, that's a good guide. Um, they're also very good indicators of climate change. And as uh, we've seen um, in Britain, as in many other, many other parts of the world, dragonfly ranges have been changing, um, particularly expanding in some cases as a result of warmer climate. They're also very ancient uh, insects. Um, they first appeared over 300 million years ago, so they have a long heritage and have been very successful over that time. And indeed, they were much in evidence at the time of the dinosaurs. It's an artist's representation of one of the oldest dragonflies we know, a, a German fossil um, found that uh, was dated at 315 million years old. So you can see the basic wing shape of the wing form is the same as we can see today. Their early ancestors had very large wings. Indeed, some of these dragonflies had wingspans exceeding that of um, the kestrels that we can see today. And that very complex wing structure, which I'll talk about more later on, enables them to undertake this wonderfully rapid um, and amazing flight. So dragonflies are made up of um, two groups, the, the damselflies and the true dragonflies, the zygoptera and the anisoptera, and together these um, form the odonata, or the toothed ones. The anisoptera, we can see here an emperor dragonfly, have um, once they've emerged, uh, their wings are held out at right angles to the body, and they stay like that. Uh, the front wings are uh, uh, slightly smaller, a different shape to the hind wings. Whereas in damselflies, uh, here we've got a, a small red-eyed damselfly, all four wings are identical, and in most species they're usually held together over the abdomen. Globally, um, well over 6,000 species have been described. In fact, the true total might be well in excess of 7,000. Um, that's a pretty large number. Most of these species live in the tropics, like many insect groups. They're concentrated in the hottest parts of the world, with rather fewer in temperate regions like Europe. Less than 150 of that 6,000 odd species have occurred in Europe, and only 58 of those have been found in the UK. And we have currently 47 breeding species, including a few uh, new colonists. And that 47 is made up of slightly more dragonflies, 27 species, uh, compared with 20 species of damselfly. Uh, here's our emperor dragonfly again. Um, let's have a look more closely at it. It's an insect, therefore it has a body made up of three parts, the head, the thorax, 
and the abdomen. The head, as you can see in this emperor dragonfly, is dominated very much by those two huge compound eyes. The thorax has all four wings attached to it and underneath six legs. And the abdomen is divided into 10 segments and you can see they're numbered sequentially from the base S1 up to S10. And right at the tip there are appendages uh, which are used in mating and egg laying depending on the sex. Here's a small red-eyed damselfly with the same things shown. Um, additionally here we've got the pronotum I'll come back to the pronotum, that's a, a shield that forms the front end of the thorax, right behind the head. And also uh, the wing spots. So these are a slightly heavier cell towards the tip of the wing and both damselflies and dragonflies have um, wing spots or technically pterostigmas. So yeah, dragonflies are fantastic flyers. The emperor there will patrol for literally hours on end, eating on the wing. Other dragonflies perhaps um, less able to do this, um, certainly taking prey generally to a perch to eat it. And with a common data on the bottom left, we can see very large eyes again, multifaceted eyes that can detect uh, movement in almost every direction, not so good at seeing behind them, um, but that helps them to pick up prey, potential partners, and of course rival males if they're a male on their territory. And on the bottom right you get a flavour for the uh, intricate mouth parts that are required to chomp into their insect prey. Most of their prey comprises flies. And here's a close up of the legs of on the left white legged damselfly, which are rather have these rather exaggerated long spines, which uh, when you can I'm sure visualize when they're put together, they form a, a really good basket, a catching trap to pick up prey and bring it up to the mouth parts. And on the right, I've just uh, got a close up there of the two claws that um, are found on the tips of many insect legs, but uh, in particular the dragonflies, and that gives them a phenomenally good grip, amazingly strong grip. Those claws, in fact, can do some considerable damage to the wings of other dragonflies and damselflies. Um, but here we've got some fairly pristine uh, wings uh, on display. The backbone if you like of a wing is is the very strong vein the costa or the costal vein along the front edge of each wing um, it's broken part way along by um, what's known as the node it's a, a little bendy point in the wing that enables them sometimes to flex their wings maybe to escape being predated um, and you can also, I hope here, appreciate in the top images the three-dimensionality of dragonfly wings. They are um, corrugated to, to a fair degree and supported by um, the equivalent of RSJs, so uh, right-angle steel joists. So you've got these um, very strong cross veins giving them additional support. But there's also amazing flexibility uh, that enables the wings to, to twist um, which uh, gives them the ability to fly quickly. And there again is that wing spot or pterostigma, which uh, um, helps as a, a sort of counterbalance and helps with wing stability when they're flying fast. Okay, I mentioned earlier that dragonflies have a unique uh, mating behaviour. And here it is, what we can see here is often known as the uh, the heart position or wheel position, heart for romantics, I think. Um, so, but to help to explain what's going on here, I'm, I'm going to take you through um, the characteristics of males and then females. So males have what are known as secondary genitalia or accessory genitalia. 
under the base of their abdomen. Um, you can see there the uh, sort of gaping hole top left. And then on the right, we've got um, that swollen uh, area which shows the, the opening of the accessory genitalia. These are used to um, store sperm. Sperm is transferred into here before mating, before females are grabbed. Um, and then the sperm is transferred from there to the female. You can even see it in this newly emerged four spotted chaser. So we can tell even at this stage that this is definitely a male. And in damselflies, the same bulge here on a blue tailed damselfly. It's useful to keep an eye open for these so you know what sex of dragonfly or damselfly you're dealing with, and it can help you to work out the identification sometimes. Females, um, however, have egg laying apparatus under the tip of their abdomen. You can see here um, the bulges under the three damselfly species on the right, um, which contain the ovipositor, the egg laying organ. And on the left, two southern hawker images. On the central, the right hand of those two images, um, you can see the very sharp sickle shaped ovipositor um, going down into, in this case, rotten wood to lay eggs into. And next to it, we've got the golden ring dragonfly, which has an exceptionally long ovipositor that extends out as a point. And they, they use these to uh, basically bounce up and down like a pogo stick into um, little streams and flushes and inject eggs into the, the gravel or um, grot at the bottom. So all damselflies and all hawkers and the golden ring dragonfly have an ovipositor that's designed for inserting eggs into material. All of the other dragonflies have a vulva scale under the tip of the abdomen and eggs are produced from there and go straight usually into, into water. Now, because females produce eggs, their abdomens are broader than those of the males. And there we've um, repeated uh, the male blue tail damselfly alongside the female for comparison. You can see the male has um, a much more slender abdomen. And uh, again, we can see the bulge under the base with his accessory genitalia, whereas the female, we can see the more swollen tip, which contains the ovipositor. The appendages at the tip of the abdomen are used in mating. The male damselflies have two pairs of appendages, two upper and two lower, used for grasping the pronotum of the female. And of course, this grasping is, is done as the male flies around. So he's um, amazingly managing to lock on to the female just behind the head. In the case of dragonflies, the males have two upper and one lower appendage. Uh, the two upper appendages uh, clasp the back of the eyes of the female and the lower appendage um, sits between the eyes. And again, amazingly, they manage to grab females very often in flight to, uh, to start the mating process. There's the female pronotum showed in, in some detail in three different damselfly species. And you can see that the rear edge of it varies from a fairly simple, almost straight line to a rather more convoluted process. And in the case of the white legged damselfly, a very complex arched process. And these are quite difficult to see, um, very difficult to see in the field, best in the hand or with um, a high resolution photograph. And the shape of this um, pronotum, the rear edge of the pronotum, is designed to precisely fit the male's appendages. So you have a sort of lock and key mechanism 
or the chastity belt, some have referred to it as. So once the male has grasped the female, they're said to be in tandem, and you can often see them flying around or sometimes perched in this position. You can see in the close up there um, on the right, the male common data grasping the back of the female's head. So if the female wishes to go ahead and mate, and it is her choice, she brings her abdomen to link the male's accessory genitalia. That's when the mating wheel is formed and copulation then occurs. So that can be a fairly brief affair. So for example, chasers will mate in the air within a few seconds. But any longer matings uh, like these common darters and certainly the blue tail damselflies here will, will entail the displacement of any sperm that the female has already um, taken on board. Um, the, uh, you'll see from the note on the left that blue tailed damselflies, I think, seem to hold the world record for um, the length of mating um, and several hours. Very often in late afternoons they will mate, and I think egg laying then happens also quite late in the day by the females. But because of this quite long um, period of mating, mating damselflies are not quite guaranteed, but very often will be blue tails. So following mating, the females are ready to lay eggs. Um, they can mate on several occasions and lay eggs over a period of several days, maybe even longer. In the case of the damselflies and dragonflies with obvious ovipositors, the eggs are laid into plant material, um, either above the water surface or often just below it. Um, the males of most uh, damselfly species uh, stay attached, and that's to guard the females from any further matings. I think it's fair to say that uh, blue-tailed damselflies are notable amongst damselflies in laying alone. The females lay alone, so you won't see males attached to them. And indeed, most dragonflies will lay without males in attendance, although sometimes they do. Here we've got two actually rather unusual pictures of emerald damselflies laying eggs. On the left, the female has gone uh, well underwater and um, laying eggs into a rush stem. On the right, equally unusually, um, they're laying above water into a woody stem, a twig of a willow here. Usually they're laying above the water into rushes. That's where they commonly lay. You can see the male on the right just about, see, uh, um, he's attracted the interest of an ant. Um, it's not unusual for ants to uh, investigate um, all insects, of course, as potential prey items. The common blue damselfly, um, although uh, initially linked up, the females will go underwater to lay eggs, uh, usually do go underwater to lay eggs, and are um, then uh, released by the males. The males don't go underneath with them. And they may stay underwater for quite a while. And when they re-emerge or try to re-emerge through the surface tension, the meniscus um, holds them under the water um, and they're struggling to get out of that surface tension, attracts the attention of males flying um, on patrol over the water surface. Um, we'll see that in a moment, but uh, the uh, male then rescues the female, if you like, um, um, and flies off to the shore, where, of course, he expects favours in return. So the female may well end up mating again. Showing a pair that have just separated, the male still on the surface, the female um, walking around 
You can just see the underside of her abdomen there and her wings covered in a silvery film of air and she's probing, looking for places to lay eggs. This male's not in particularly good condition. He's got um, quite a severe breakage across one of his wings and he's having difficulty uh, flying away again, but normally he wouldn't hang around on the surface like that. You can see common, mainly common blue damselflies, territorial males, um, or rather males trolling, looking for these females uh, as potential mates. And this is a very common summer occurrence over large lakes and reservoirs, um, big ponds. So that's common blue damselfly. So these are the blue matchsticks you see flying over ponds during the summer. Hawkers and emperors uh, also lay eggs into plant material, but um, equally into rotten wood and organic debris. And I mentioned also earlier, the golden ringed lays by this pogo stick motion bouncing up and down. So here's an emperor laying eggs into a very thin stem of broadleaf pondweed. Um, doing the same. And you can see that sickle shaped ovipositor there on the pond leaf, um, trying to find somewhere to suitable to lay an egg. It's often a, a good time to get a close view of dragonflies when they're egg laying. They tend to be rather preoccupied. And females will often lay um, during poorer weather when males aren't flying around, giving them uh, Hassle. A few damselflies, egg laying, male characteristically still attached to the female. And you can just about see the female's sickle shaped ovipositor injecting eggs, breaking into the broadleaf pondweed stem there and injecting eggs. Emerald, <coughs> excuse me, emerald dragonflies and chasers and skimmers lay eggs by repeatedly dipping their abdomen in, into the uh, into the water, um, with um, with males attached. Darters also do this, but um, uh, males may not remain attached. So you'll sometimes see female darters laying eggs on their own. of a female broad-bodied chaser repeatedly dipping the tip of her abdomen into the water and each time she'll leave an egg um, to drift down in the water column maybe right down to the bottom of the water sometimes the eggs uh, will stick to material plant material on the way down but she's clearly found a really good spot here and thinks it's appropriate to lay quite a lot of eggs here. So let's not forget that dragonflies are aquatic insects. They spend all of um, their larval life in the water. Those eggs that we've seen being laid will hatch uh, usually within a, a few weeks, but sometimes um, they will overwinter in the egg stage and hatch in the following spring. Emerald damselflies are noteworthy in this respect, but others do it as well. When the egg hatches, a rather tadpole-like prolarva comes out, um, and pretty much as soon as it's broken free of the egg, it will molt into a tiny larva or nymph as they're often known. The larvae grow via a series of molts um, 
often uh, about a dozen molts until the final stage larva when the developing wings can be seen inside wing sheaths, very conspicuous um, containers at the base of their abdomen. They develop um, until they're fully grown over usually one to two years, sometimes three years, occasionally up to five or six years in the case of golden ring dragonflies. But this very much depends on the food supply in the water. And basically, like any predators, if they can eat a lot, they will, and they will grow quickly as a result. Emerald damselflies are somewhat exceptional in this development process, and they can develop very quickly from eggs that hatch in late winter, early spring, over maybe 10 or 12 weeks to emerge in mid to late summer. So most of a dragonfly's life, with the exception of maybe the emerald damselflies, is spent underwater. Let's not forget that, that's very important in terms of their habitat conservation. Larvae come in three basic types. Dams, all damselflies are long and thin with usually three tails or caudal lamellae at the back. Hawker types come in a torpedo shape, long and thin, but quite bulky. And spiders, uh, the other damselflies, hawkers, darters, chasers, emeralds, skimmers, look rather spider-like, rather chunky, with long legs. So let's take a closer look at these. Our common blue damselfly top right, we can see those three external gills, the lamellae. And the characteristic thing about damselflies as opposed to dragonfly larvae is that they wriggle, and that's the way they swim. The hawker types, like the emperor dragonfly here, um, are mostly active hunters. They can move through vegetation and they can swim um, quite rapidly if needs be by ejecting water from their rear end. A common data can also uh, do this. They all breathe through their rectum um, as opposed to the damselflies which have these gills. Um, but the common data there is, is rather squat. Some of these squat Larvae live in mud and sand and organic debris at the bottom of the water column. So what do larvae want? Well, I think you've already got a hint, um, but certainly fresh water. We have a few species that can tolerate slightly brackish waters, um, but most species like good clean water. And we include here both still waters like ponds and ditches, and slow flowing fresh waters like rivers and canals, and sometimes fast flowing waters uh, like uh, upland streams. Uh, I think generally speaking, a lack of trees is good for them. A few species do prefer wooded margins, and for some it does seem to be necessary. What's in the water is very important for many species. So a variety of submerged pond weeds, or in the case of some species, organic debris to live in, or mineral sediment like sand and gravel to, to live in. But the majority of the species are interested in the vegetation growing underneath the water surface. So that the species and the architecture um, that it forms that three-dimensional um, underwater forest, if you like, is, is what a lot of dragonflies and damselflies require. And within there, there should be a good supply of invertebrates. Obviously, these are predators, so we need lots of things for them to eat. And that can be quite large things, um, tadpoles, small fish, newt larvae, perhaps. Um, but very often it'll be very small things like um, anything from water fleas up to uh, midge larvae or mosquito larvae. It's very important for dragonflies that they don't get eaten, of course. There is a certain amount of cannibalism goes on and certainly big 
emperor dragonflies, for example, can eat small emperor dragonflies and other species. Um, but much of the predation actually happens uh, via fish. Um, newts are particularly good predators. Um, so uh, I think it's important um, if you're having a wildlife pond, particularly a small pond, maybe in a garden, and you want to attract dragonflies in particular, that you don't put any fish into it. They also need, and we'll come on to this shortly, suitable places to emerge. So emergent plants along the margins, um, not necessarily as big as reeds, but quite small plants very often important for smaller species to climb up and emerge on. This emergence process, which is one of the miracles of um, the dragonfly world or the insect world, and is always a, um, a wonderful privilege to witness. Emergence sometimes takes place at night in the case of large species, like this emperor uh, sequence that I'm going to show you now. Um, but it, uh, it will take place uh, over two or three hours, roughly. Um, and it's an extremely um, sensitive stage for dragonflies. They're very vulnerable to predation and also to bad weather, changes in weather. So not just uh, rain, but wind also can, can cause them problems when they're emerging. So here, the first stage, the larva will have spent a day or two um, hanging out near the edge of the pond, near the surface of the pond, actually poking its head out, starting to breathe air through the spiracles in the side of its thorax. The eyes um, will start to look pale as the skin starts to separate from the adult within. It needs a very secure place to emerge. And that's where these incredibly sharp claws come in very handy. Um, so they'll select a piece of vegetation very often that's about the right sort of size for them. So an emperor will be able to emerge on a broader uh, leaf, for example, than a small damselfly, which can maybe get away with a small rush stem. By redistributing its body fluids, the thorax swells and the back of the thorax, the larval skin, splits and emergence begins. And very slowly but surely, the adult um, squeezes itself out or expands its way out. And in the case of dragonflies, they hang back like this for maybe half an hour while the legs harden off and become strong enough for the next stage, which is to reach forward quickly and pull the rear end out. So then the abdomen is extracted. Again, the body fluids are redistributed and the abdomen is expanded, it swells up, and the beast then starts to become about twice the length of the larval skin that it's emerged from. The wings are the next stage, so the wings are pumped up. And finally, the wings are spread. And provided conditions are right, then the individual will take its maiden flight, a weak affair, usually only a short distance from the emergent site. And of course, the larval skin or exuvia is left behind. And um, the exuvia are quite interesting because, um, for one thing, they give us absolute proof that that species has bred at that site. Um, but also they can, um, in Britain, be identified fairly easily to species. A little bit trickier in the damselflies, but dragonflies, uh, not too difficult to identify the species after the adults have flown away. Same process more or less happens with damselflies. Here's a common blue emerging actually on a, a lichen covered piece of wood. They don't, however, hang back. So the third image from the left shows the, uh, that resting phase where the legs harden off. 
and damselflies um, invariably emerge in daylight, whereas, as I've said, some of the larger dragonflies, the hawkers in particular, and the emperors emerge at night and um, they take their maiden flight, usually around first light. Um, has to be um, in good conditions. So sometimes if the weather's bad, you'll see adults um, still hanging on to their emergence perches a day or two, or sometimes even longer after they've emerged, waiting for some good weather. So there on the left, we can see a, a white-legged damselfly, newly emerged, um, not quite fully pumped up yet, I think, but uh, it takes quite a while for them to color up and harden off. So they're not, um, people sometimes refer to, to them drying off. In fact, uh, the liquid is inside the wings. That's what makes them um, quite uh, dull and reflective um, when they're opened. At that stage is there's still liquid retained within them. And before they fly, some of that liquid is withdrawn and vented uh, from the rear end. On the right, we can see a four spotted chaser after its maiden flight. Um, you're hard pushed to identify dragonflies and damselflies before they've hardened off and coloured up, which can take a day or two. Um, and then the full colours take even longer to appear. But here we can just see the dark patches in the wings forming. Um, the dark spots at the nodes that gives four spotted chaser its name, still rather greyish, and the dark wing bases that tell us it's a chaser, still darkening up. We can also see in this uh, individual a lot of hair because it's against a pale sky. Um, and a lot of these quite early emerging species in the spring have um, very obvious hairy, almost downy thoraxes and sometimes abdomen too. So having emerged, we can see here uh, what's known as a tenoral scarce chaser. I'm going to show you a series of images showing color changes in, in this um, rather scarce species. So here we can see those very reflective wings and relatively poor coloration at this stage. So this would be um, on the same day as it's crawled out of its larval case. Um, within a day or two, it will look like this. Both males and females similarly colored. Um, we can sex them actually by the fact that they have short appendages at the tip of the abdomen, short and widely spaced in the case of female chasers and skimmers and darters likewise. The male, however, soon, um, sorry, the female then goes on to darken with age and sometimes become really rather greyish, um, dull coloured by comparison with the immature female. The males, however, um, will start to exude a waxy um, substance on their abdomens, which turns them blue. Um, so they then become pruinose, rather like plums have a pruinosity. Um, and that develops over a, a several days of good weather and good food to produce the mature male, which looks like this, with that mostly blue-gray abdomen. We can see some very slight darkening in the middle which is where a female has mated with him and scratched with her legs. The spines on her legs um, scratch this waxy exudate. And finally, um, in a few cases of skimmers and also darters and chasers, um, females will become pruinose like the males. They will develop this blueness in the case of the scarce chaser. Here's a few tips on how to go about watching dragonflies. Firstly, it's very important in our temperate climate to go out when the weather is nice. So dragonflies essentially are around during the spring, summer 
and autumn months, mostly in the middle of summer. Um, and that's, of course, when we tend to have our warmest weather. So the warmth, the temperature is rather critical. And um, I always regard 17 degrees as being a fairly important temperature. It's when a lot of things start to move around. But for dragonflies to fly around actively, the muscles in their thorax need to reach uh, a temperature of more than 30 degrees. So we don't often have uh, shade conditions of in the 30s. So they do this by basking. So they need to be in the sun. So we need open sunshine. Um, and also calm weather helps, particularly for damselflies, which are rather weaker flyers. Um, but uh, the calmer it is and the sunnier and warmer it is, the more active they can become, the more easy it is for them to evade predators as well at that point. So in nice warm summers, we tend to see larger numbers because of reduced mortality. Most of the activity because of this requirement of good weather and plenty of sunshine is between mid morning and late afternoon. Sometimes it'll go on into the evenings if it's been a very warm day. And sometimes when it's extremely warm, they may just hang up in the shade somewhere to avoid overheating. And in hotter climates, it's common to see dragonflies in particular dunking themselves in the water, apparently to cool down or maybe to wash off as well. So when you're walking up looking for dragonflies, keep the sun behind you if you can. Certainly, as with other insects, try and avoid casting a shadow over them because they notice this um, um, very, uh, very quickly and, uh, and will fly away. Um, again, try not to wear loud clothing. Um, by that, I mean the bright colours, whites, and av particularly avoid sudden movements. So learn to stalk your prey, as it were. You can also, of course, use these days close focus binoculars. Um, I would always recommend something like an eight times magnification. So you'll see eight by 30, eight by 40 times binoculars. Uh, and if these can focus down to two or three meters, then these are much easier than actually trying to stalk dragonflies uh, to enable your naked eye to see details. We these days have good quality uh, digital cameras. Um, even smartphones can take useful pictures, but um, a bridge camera or uh, a digital single lens reflex camera are extremely useful in taking good images and being able to instantly zoom up and check critical features, as well, of course, as being able to send those photographs on to other people if you want them to have a look and check the identity. I would always recommend using a good field guide. These days there are quite good online resources. Um, and of course, I do feel obliged to mention one particular very good field guide. Um, we'll say no more about that. Um, please make a habit of writing down what you see. Digital photographs will come with a signature of sorts, uh, often a GPS reference, um, but a particularly a date and time. And with those details, you yourself will be able to build up your knowledge and experience of dragonflies. But please do make the best use of your sightings. Um, and as a citizen scientist, submit your records. Um, you can join the British Dragonfly Society, of course, and go on field meetings that are held regularly around the country in, in the summer months. Here is a little taster. Um, we can break down Britain's dragonflies into 12 basic types. Um, so six types of damselfly and six types of dragonfly. So that's really, as I say, just a taster to get you on to the next stage of identifying dragonflies. I'm going to leave you with this information about the BDS, our aims, um, our staff, our wonderful website where you can find an identification guide 
Um, you can find the latest uh, news on dragonfly sightings. Um, the BDS maintains a, a database of all dragonfly records, and indeed it's, it's one of the most important things that we do. And anyone, including you, can submit your sightings. We would prefer you to use iRecord, um, which is the Biological Records Center um, recording scheme for wildlife. There's a link for it. And indeed, once those records are on the database, they are transferred regularly to the NBN Atlas, where anyone and everyone around the world can um, find out what occurs where. Thank you very much for watching and listening.